Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of the Star Citizen Alpha Bootcamp. Today, we're continuing our look at the backstory of Star Citizen. Hello everyone, I am Bridger, and this is part two of a three-part series where we explore the backstory of Star Citizen. If you haven't watched the first part yet, I highly recommend you click the link on the screen and go back and watch that first. We did get a new Tetrahedron of Tachyon, so let's tune back in to that lecture from 2944. Now, in the same century that we met the Banu, Earth was facing a problem. The Earth in 2460 was overcrowded, and there were many reasons to leave and colonize new planets. The problem the UNE faced was the apprehension amongst the public. It wasn't until RSI launched an aggressive advertising campaign that the public opinion about space travel started to shift. Slowly, over the next few decades, space travel became more and more routine in the mind of the normal citizens, and many millions began emigrating to newly terraformed planets. Now, we move on to 2516 and the next great discovery for humanity. We had expanded into 12 systems, and even though we had comm relays and jump technology, Earth was starting to feel pretty far away for the people that were on the fringe of human space. Just at this time, a new planet was discovered that was remarkably similar to the Earth. It had a natural oxygen-nitrogen environment with vast oceans, indigenous vegetation, and temperate climates. This planet is still known today as the most naturally Earth-like planet ever colonized, and it was named Terra in honor of that similarity. Terra was unique not only for its extreme similarity to Earth, but also due to its system's abundance of jump points. Six jump points were immediately discovered in the system, and it was quickly settled and utilized as a forward base of operations for future human expansion. Earth would supply and expand the borders in one direction, while Terra supplied and expanded the borders in the other side of the known galaxy. Fast forward a few years after Terra is colonized. At this point, it's been over 300 years since humans started colonizing planets outside our own solar system. Over 70% of the total human population now lives somewhere other than Earth. The government at the time, the United Nations of Earth, only granted representation to the nations that existed on Earth. Planets other than Earth didn't get a say in the UNE. The people at this time are clamoring for representation as law after law get put into effect which favor Earth and Sol over all other systems. This is one of those points in time where change is happening. The UNE has a choice. They can ride the change or resist it. Most experts agree that if the UNE had resisted this change, it would have shattered the united front that humanity had maintained. Luckily for all of us, the leaders of the UNE at this time chose the wiser course. In 2523, the government was radically redesigned to include representation from all human worlds. This redesigned government was called the United Planets of Earth. Now, even though historians all agree that this was the wisest course, it didn't suffer from a lack of criticism at the time. The new governmental system created a tribunal as the head of government. The High Secretary would oversee the legislative branch and deal with the infrastructure between planets. The High General would oversee the military for defense against external threats. And the High Advocate would oversee law enforcement and the judicial branch. Some thought that this put far too much power into the hands of far too few people. It is very similar to the system that we have today, without the Imperator as the head of the tribunal, of course. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The next major milestone for humanity took place in 2530. In keeping with our fantastic record for diplomatic relations, we encountered yet another new alien race in a most unfortunate manner. The feeling at this time was one of expand as fast as possible. Human corporations were making enormous sums of money by terraforming planets and selling them off to colonists. Of course, the corporations fought over the best worlds, and if you waited too long, 
Someone else would come along, drop in, and steal your claim. This is precisely the environment that causes corporations to cut corners. And Gaia Planet Services has gone down in history for this very facet of their corporate culture. GPS attempted to terraform a planet without authorization. They didn't even do any rudimentary scans to determine if there was life already on the planet. Well, it turns out that not only was there life, but there was intelligent life. A spacefaring race we now know as the Xi'an were there already, and they called for backup. When the Xi'an warships arrived, they captured the 276 members of the initial terraforming crew. Luckily for us, the Xi'an are not hot-tempered. They took this affront with dignity. They released the foreman, Charles Baxter, as a sign of good faith. He explained the situation to the UPE, and they sent a delegation to negotiate with the Xi'an. It took 15 days to work out a communications method, then another 42 days for the negotiation itself. Finally, the other hostages were released, and war was avoided. But relations with the Xi'an would be tense for a long time to come. The Xi'an are one of the more mysterious races that we've had contact with. They have always been very distant and concerned about us, and we about them. Unlike the Banu, they were not forthcoming about trade or technology and have maintained a guarded diplomatic relationship with us. They are on par with us technology-wise, we hope, and perhaps maybe a little more advanced. This Capability for mutual destruction is perhaps the only thing that has prevented a war from ever breaking out between us. The Xi'an themselves are fairly remarkable. They have an absolute hereditary monarchy, with the title of emperor passing down through the family line. Now, the other extremely unusual facet of the Xi'an is that they can live for centuries. In fact, the current Xi'an Emperor, Emperor Cray, has been the ruler for almost as long as we've known that the Xi'an existed. He still remembers our behavior during the dark period of the UEE. This allows the Xi'an to think in terms of decades instead of years. Now, those of you who have ever looked at a star map will know that Xi'an territory is in the eastern section of the galaxy, near Terra, and this was essentially as far as we could expand in that direction. We were still unchallenged to the west of Earth, however, and continued to expand in that direction. That would change in 2541, when we first discovered the Tevarin in what is known today as the Elysium system. Would this finally be the moment when our disastrous first contact streak would be broken? Unfortunately not. But the good news here is that it wasn't our fault this time. The Tevarin were about 100 years behind us in technology and had just started colonizing other systems. They adhered to a rigid warrior ethos, honoring duty and fealty as virtues. That is not to say that they were a bloodthirsty race, but simply honored the art of combat. Unfortunately, those traits which they valued most highly were the traits which would be the ruin of their civilization. We reached out to them in an attempt to bring them into the UPE, offering technology and trade as benefits. They were not interested in diplomatic relations. What they were interested in was our systems, and their preferred method of acquisition was through conquest. And so it was in 2541 that the first Tevarin War began. Though they were technologically inferior by about a century, they more than made up for this in strategic brilliance and in endurance, causing the war to last over four years. It is agreed among historians that the major turning point in the war was the Battle of Idris IV, in which a bright young officer, Ivar Messer, maneuvered a large Tevarin fleet into a trap and massacred them. For those of you wondering, yes, this is THE Ivar Messer. This was the success which catapulted him into the public consciousness. His stunning victory was used by the military to improve morale, and they molded him into the face of the war effort. He was a war hero, and they made sure 
everyone in the United Planets of Earth knew it. And so, in 2546, the war finally ends when Messer, now promoted to commander, brings the captured Tevarin leader to the UPE Senate floor. The United Planets of Earth evict the Tevarin from their homeworld on Elysium IV and terraform it for human settlement. Messer's enormous popularity and seeming humility allow him an easy ascension to the office of High General. Shortly after he arrives, however, his ambition becomes clear to those who are paying attention. His charismatic charm wins over the public, and so when he proposes that the tribunal is responsible for the length of the war, people believe him. His argument was that the three-leader system prevented the UPE from moving as swiftly and decisively as was needed to end the war sooner. And so Messer proposed the creation of a prime citizen in charge of the UPE who would be advised by the tribunal. With the war over, however, he needed to find a reason for this change. The Xi'an threat was his reason. The public still had a considerable level of concern over the Xi'an. Nobody knew their real capabilities. They refused to share technology. Our relationship with them simply hadn't been as friendly or as prosperous as with the Banu. Messer used his popularity and charm to expand this concern into outright fear. He argued that having a prime citizen was essential in the event of a Xi'an invasion. He was, of course, honored and humbled to be chosen as the first prime citizen. Sorry everyone, looks like we ran out of tachyons yet again. Check out Tales of Citizens number 7 with a focus on politics and organizations, or click the link to head to the third and final part of the history of the United Empire of Earth. I'm Bridger, signing off. Catch you next time.